Hi everyone, welcome to Satire Can Save Us All. This is the webcast where we talk about satire and cartooning around the globe in this crazy era of coronavirus. I'm Kevin Cal Calher, I'm your host. I'm the cartoonist for The Economist magazine of London for the Baltimore Sun here in Maryland and also for Counterpoint, which is an online newsletter. So uh, on May the 3rd, it was Press Freedom Day, World Press Freedom Day, as announced by the United Nations. And this is a day when you um, celebrate and draw attention to the value that press freedom brings to many parts of the planet. So in this episode, I wanted to talk to someone who is really knowledgeable about the challenges of press freedom. Uh, his name is Terry Anderson, and he's head of a human rights group who looks after the plight of cartoonists who are in trouble around the globe. We're also going to have a brief chat with our satire correspondent and then close out with our good friend Bowser McSchnauzer. But first, let me introduce you to our interviewee this week. Uh, Terry Anderson is born and raised and currently resides in Paisley, Scotland, outside of Glasgow. And for 25 years, he's been both a cartoonist and a caricaturist. He's also a founding member of the Scottish Cartoon Arts Studio. And more recently, he's been known throughout the cartoon community as the new executive director of Cartoonist Rights Network International, which is a human rights group which looks after cartoonists in trouble around the globe. For a time, some years ago, I was president of this organization and I have great respect for what it does and it, Terry will sh tell you more about the challenges and some of the great things that they are doing. Tell the folks, um, you know, in a nutshell, what does Cartoonist Rights Network International do? So we are a human rights organization, but we focus upon cartoonists. And what that generally speaking means is that if a cartoonist is being persecuted, criminalized, threatened, harassed, uh, jailed, beaten, in the worst case scenario, killed because of the work that they have produced, the images that they have created, then we are interested in their case and doing whatever we can to assist them, whether that's material assistance, uh, lobbying on their behalf, trying to get a hold of officialdom in the country where the incident has happened, getting other cartoonists involved, mounting campaigns, showing solidarity and support. It varies from case to case, of course. But ultimately, what we want to do is strive towards a world where cartoonists everywhere, of every description, can produce the images that they want, express themselves the way that they want, enjoy the human right that they have to freedom of expression, and not suffer for it. Now, many people will be surprised to hear that cartoonists would suffer in such a way. Um, why do you think that cartoons get this kind of attention? Well, a couple of reasons. This is where we have an argument about the most appropriate metaphor, because uh, the one you hear all the time is, is uh, Canaries in the Coal Mine. Um, I don't like that because the Canaries were disposable by definition, and I don't think we are dispensable in that same way. So I think that cartoonists are like a safety valve. Satire is like a safety valve on, on society. It's a way of expressing dissent, dissatisfaction, anger, um, frustration, disgust, uh, safely, with nobody being harmed, uh, allowing you to move on with your day and function. You see a piece of satire that you like, that hits home, that resonates with you. There's a release, um, and then you can move on. You know, you've already had conversations with others about how a satirical cartoon isn't necessarily supposed to elicit a belly laugh every time. And that's that's true. It's not just about yucks. It's not we're not just telling jokes for the sake of it. Um, satire should 
illuminate something. Um, and here's metaphor number two. You know, say that the emperor has no clothes. Point out to the citizenry that there is a problem here. Um, but do it in such a way that uh, that nobody is harmed. And precisely because it's couched in, in satire, it's couched in humour, you know, you, some people can say that, 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 that cartoons are reductive. Uh, that sounds negative, but in a way it isn't. What, what you're doing is you're distilling something. You're saying something immediate and in a way that prose can't. Prose is great for unpacking an, uh, an argument and examining it. That's not really what most satirical cartoons do. Most satirical cartoons zero in on a specific thing and give you a piece of information that should should be comprehensible in a, in a matter of seconds. And because it arrives so quickly in your mind, like unbidden almost, you know, you turn the page or you swipe over to it on the tablet or however you're consuming it, it arrives in your mind almost before uh, you've had a chance to, to properly process it. And that's where the impudence of it comes from. And that ultimately is why authoritarians get pissed off mm. about it. So, it's insulting the, from their point of view. I mean, well, I, yeah, I imagine from their <laughs> point of view, for sure. The um, uh, Give me a, 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 a how many countries, how many cartoonists do we have on our list of you know, endangered or targeted cartoonists? Mm -hmm. We, at any given time, we are probably monitoring no more than five. Um, if there was more than five cases on the go at a given time, that would be highly unusual. And and they would probably be a cluster of cases that would amount to the same case, if you follow me, rather than it being entirely different narratives. So, for example, in the year that Charlie Hebdo happened, obviously, a disproportionate number of cartoonists died, but it was it was one incident. It wasn't a rash of of, of killings. Um, over the years, you know, and it's and it's over twenty years now for Sierra and I. I'm I'm a relative newcomer to it. Um, you know, hundreds of cartoonists have been assisted or contacted or supported or counselled, or we've been involved with their story in, in some small ways some massive ways, some life-saving ways. Um, but a lot of the time, some of them, all they want is a sense that they have been heard, that they have been uh, taken notice of, that solidarity is being expressed. And the great thing about us, it's certainly true now with somebody like me with the hand on the tiller, but also in terms of the people that we have on our board, and the regional representatives that we have, uh, who are all cartoonists themselves, it's an organization run by and for cartoonists. So what's great about it is if you're somebody who's working alone, as so many cartoonists now do, and you find yourself in trouble and you're contacted by us, there's a lot of stuff you don't have to say. There's a lot of shorthand because we already know we can sympathize so immediately because we're all cartoonists. So it it, it, it cuts out a lot of toing and throwing that might occur uh, with, with, with other organizations or, or with, with, with other means of support. Now, you, you said um, saving lives. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a, a few examples of... Um, sure. That, uh, that in, 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 recent, in recent memory... Um, Somebody like Pedro Molina, a Nicaraguan cartoonist. Um, the Ortega regime has been cracking down on, on civil rights for the last number of years uh, in, in Nicaragua. And towards the tail end of, well, in 2018, I should say, um, he was the winner of our annual award. We give an award each year to a, a cartoonist who's exhibited exemplary bravery in speaking truth to power or... Or, or suffering in some particular way because of, of the work that they created. So he was our winner that summer. And then towards the end of 2018, 
uh, the news organization where he uh, had a, a desk job, uh, a regular cartoon and gig, was raided by the, the police. Everything was seized. The way these things normally go is that's a precursor to arrests because evidence will be planted or some narrative will be spun that on these computers and servers that were confiscated, we found such and such evidence. And so having already been followed and tailed uh, and um, had some threatening uh, uh, interactions with uh, paramilitaries uh, in Nicaragua, Pedro really felt as if the moment of crisis had arrived. Um, so there's another organisation that we work with called uh, ICORN, who are the uh, International Cities of Refuge Network. They were able to find a city that was willing to host uh, Pedro and his family, um, and we paid for his ticket out. So we got him out uh, that Christmas um, and he was able to escape. And of course, it's even more complicated when there's a family involved because people obviously don't want to leave their loved ones in, in, in harm's way. So that's a family of four that needed to be um, evacuated uh, essentially before uh, anything happened. So at times like that, where the difference between potentially disappearing forever or not is a plane ticket, if we, you know, we've got the money to spend on something like that, uh, then we'll do it, you know, and, and that's the the final connection, if you like, is made and the person gets out. And I'm happy to say that since then, um, Pedro got a, a, a teaching job at um, Cornell in, in Ithaca in New York and has been able to continue to produce cartoons thereafter, which is, which is the main thing, always. You want, if somebody's in danger, you want to, to save their life but ideally what you want to do is also save the career you know you want them to be producing afterwards um, which isn't always the case unfortunately but if, mm. that, if that can be achieved then that's the ultimate goal mm. so there's uh your clients are around the world uh, are there certain parts of the world where there's there you're, you're finding more trouble or more cartoonists are reaching out it varies. Um, kind of like perennial hotspots or, or or places we'll hear from frequently are probably mostly in the Middle East or Asia. Um, you know, we hear from Iranian cartoonists quite often, uh, Palestinian cartoonists. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been a, a number of cases out of Africa as well. South, uh, South America, obviously, with somebody like Pedro. Um, but there's a temptation to consider it a, a, a developing world or a global South problem. Um, and that's not the case. You know, we all have reasons to be concerned and, and, and vigilant. Charlie Hebdo being, you know, the most obvious example, probably. And thank goodness, nothing quite as catastrophic has ever happened again. Um, but you know, one of the case, one of the incidents of, of, of death threats um, that we, we've heard about this year was uh, a cartoonist in Belgium, and that was over uh, cartoons pertaining to coronavirus uh, and and China. Mm. So uh, the uh, diplomat, the ambassador uh, uh, from China to Belgium, had voiced displeasure about this cartoon. There was a lot of publicity around it. Um, all sorts of Chinese institutions in Belgium got involved. It's a very public uh, spat and it got very heated and it ultimately resulted in somebody um, sending a death threat. So, Yeah, the um, that is a surprise for many people is that in, in free Western nations, they still have these same sort of um, issues and problems. Um, and many of them is about around physical threats, isn't it? Now, what about the prospect of losing jobs where governments basically have forced somebody out of a job? Does that kind of come into play as well? It can do, yeah. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're prosecuted, you know, you're charged with sedition in the way that somebody like Zunar in Malaysia was, another cartoonist we've recognized with our award, or Musa Kart in Turkey. Um, who President Erdogan tried to jail three times over, um, the first two times unsuccessfully, and then the last time after the coup attempt, um, when on an industrial scale, media workers and oppositional voices were being prosecuted in Turkey. 
Uh, Musa was one of the ones uh, from his newspaper, Chimhuriye, who got accused of, uh, of supporting terrorism, essentially being fifth colonists uh, within Turkey. Um, that clearly, the, the intent clearly was to destroy the career, you know, to, to, to malign and to slander the person to such an extent and the newspaper that he worked for, that the whole thing would come tumbling down. The ludicrous thing about it was he tried on two, the two prior occasions that came down to the content of cartoons. On this last prosecution, all he had on Musa was the travel agent that he uses to book his holidays. There was material apparently on that person's computer, mm. which was a connection to a third party again. So it was all very tenuous and very nebulous, but unfortunately successful. You know, the charges were, were successfully prosecuted. So he was in prison uh, for the best part of a year. And then the Supreme Court turned it over. He got out. But then the lower court uh, has not agreed to comply with the upper court. So things are in the air at the moment, again, due to COVID-19 and so on. Uh, but technically, you know, he could go back to jail uh, at any time. And he's actually quit. He's, he's actually stopped uh, cartooning. So in a way, you know, the bad guys won. Uh, in that case, you know, the, the, the voice uh, has been kind of snuffed out. Musa's not terribly upset about it. He's been cartooning for 40 years. But nevertheless, you can't help but feel that if things have played out differently, he probably would still be producing. Uh, All right. So, Terry, can you give me an example of a, a recent case uh, where the efforts of CRNI might have been helpful? Sure. And in fact, very recently, uh, just in this past month, we were informed about a, a case that was happening in Uganda and very timely because the whole situation arose uh, entirely from the coronavirus situation. So an uh, academic and cartoonist uh, called uh, Jimmy Sentongo goes uh, by Speedy for his cartoons. Uh, he had been at a conference at uh, Cambridge University, was making his way home, and as everyone does who enters the country, went into uh, a 14-day quarantine. He was taken to a hotel that was sequestered for the purpose, and while he was there, uh, tested a negative twice over, in fact, for the, the virus, so had every expectation to return home. And then the end of the 14 days sailed past, and there was no sign of him being released. And at the same time, he was starting to notice certain discrepancies. Some people who had been there at the beginning were no longer around, became apparent that they had uh, bribed their way out of the situation, um, that um, there was disinformation around the testing about who was positive, who was negative. And he kind of started to mull it over in his mind and realised that here basically was a bit of graft. The hotel, which was never going to have normal guests under these circumstances with the lockdown and everything else, had some 75 people staying in it because they're quarantined. They're in each individual room of the hotel. And that was being billed night after night after night to the Ugandan taxpayer. So some official and somebody at the hotel were complicit as far as he was concerned. And he started to write about it uh, for uh, one of the newspapers that he contributes to, started producing cartoons, and in actual fact, towards the end of his time, even resorted to a hunger strike to bring attention to what was happening. He was supposed to be there 14 days, ended up there for the best part of 24. And our organization was alerted, as was Cartooning for Peace, based in Paris, uh, Africa Cartoons, uh, Africa Cartoons who were in South Africa, and uh, together, the three of us were, were coordinating along with uh, Speedy's lawyer to ma make a, a little bit of a song and dance about this uh, going into the Easter weekend. And in actual fact, wasn't necessary in the end because very rapidly uh, he was released. And it was specifically because of the, the cartoons that he was producing and, and the other African cartoonists had started to produce uh, in solidarity with him. So. You know, whether or not satire can save us all, I don't know, but it certainly saved him in that situation. So we learned from Terry how the coronavirus has affected cartoonists. And I was really interested in how this crisis has affected both Cartoonist Rights Network International and other human rights groups just like theirs. Most freedom of expression organizations are sounding the alarm bell and saying, 
okay, everyone or most people are at home. Much activity has been suspended. You could be forgiven for taking your eye off the ball and concentrating on your domestic affairs. But now is, is actually the time to be even more vigilant than we normally are, because now is precisely the time when everything is shut and people aren't paying attention that an authoritarian will really crack down, as we've seen with uh, Viktor Orban, for example, uh, in Hungary, you know, um, sweeping, sweeping powers introduced all under the auspices of, of COVID-19 and fighting that. But devastating for 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 civil liberty and for freedom of expression, uh, and that again is is in a is in a European country. So, how people navigate that going forward is 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 going to be a a massive challenge. And for us, for the organisations that are combating it, obviously we're worried about bluntly what are our, what are our coffers going to look like? You know, what what kind of resources are we going to have to fight this? Um, it's not a exaggeration, I think, for a lot of organisations to be to be talking about extinction. You know, it's everything is so uncertain now, and everything has changed so profoundly. And even when things go back to normal, they could go right back to where we are now at very short notice. Right. That, that's the that's the real sting, you know, in the tail is that even if we take it in stages and be really cool and calm and phase everything in September, October this year, at very short notice, we could be right back where we are. Mm. So, so Terry, now that people get an idea of the challenges ahead, both for cartoonists individually and now for professional organizations and human rights organizations like yourself, uh, what could people do to help? Oh, boy. I don't want to take my hat off and pass it around people people have got people have got so many challenges you know a uh, money is tight uh, and everything else here's an idea and i know everyone hates the guy and he should and jeff bezos should pay his taxes but if you're stuck at home and you're going to use amazon anyway and you're going to spend your money there anyway you can actually nominate a crni through the amazon smile program so a little bit of what you spend there could come our way and if it's money that you were going to spend anyway you might as well do uh, a little bit of good with it mm. um, otherwise you can you can donate to us directly through paypal or what have you there's information about that on our website uh, but more than that obviously if you have a local paper or a, a, a news platform based in your part of the world that uses cartoonists then keep your patronage there even more importantly if they don't have a cartoonist and or they don't use them ask them why continually ask them why <laughs> uh, and don't stop until you get a satisfactory answer and even if the answer is we can't afford it which it often is um you can kind of question whether that's a false economy or not um cartoonists bring eyeballs to news media so they can afford it if they're smart about it you know and they do it right um but ultimately you know in terms of like good citizenship during this period like i said we're, when we're all kind of trapped and, and and separated from each other it's just to be aware you know it's easy to disengage from it because it's so depressing and like i said and it's so samey the whole time you know it's easy to disappear into netflix and not resurface for days. But be aware of what's happening in your countries and with your governments, not just in terms of what they're doing about health or what they're doing about support for the economy, but what are they doing when it comes to the spreading of disinformation, for example? You know, nobody wants to have bad information about COVID, but in passing laws that make that a crime, to spread misinformation about COVID, for example, do we also criminalise questioning the government at all? And if that becomes a crime, then we really are all in trouble and the cartoonists will be the first to hear about it and they'll be the first to feel it. But it won't be very long until your right to protest or your right even perhaps to vote 
you know, election can be postponed in crises. Um, there can be ways by which it's there's always an excuse or there's an opportunity to say now is not the time for change. Um, so be aware of all those things. Be engaged, and and if you're lucky enough to be able to have freedom of expression uninterrupted, unimpeded. Uh, without fear of uh, reprisal, then then use it. Well, Terry, that was a, a great way to finish our conversation here, a kind of a rallying cry uh, for all of us to be uh, vigilant and also uh, to point out that cartoonists can be the uh, canary in the coal mine when it comes to certain legislation <laughs> as well. But I, this is a great um, a great thing that you're doing. We're delighted to have you in, in, in you know, at the top of the, the ladder there and, and try and fighting um, for all, while at the same time, you, like everyone else, is fighting within your own uh, community to try to stay sane and safe and to try to maintain your own um, profession and career. So it's a tough time for us all. Uh, we salute you for your efforts and thank you so much for joining uh, Satire Can Save Us All. Not at all. Thanks for having me. It's always great to talk to Terry, and I'm so delighted that he's executive director at the moment. I know that the Cartoonist Rights Network is now in good hands. But we are all facing challenges, and as Terry mentioned, in this coronavirus pandemic crisis, groups like theirs are always going to be needing as much help as they can. If you're interested in helping Cartoonist Rights Network, go to their website, cartoonistsrights.org, and see if there's some way that you can help. Now, I caught up with our satire correspondent, Alexandra Bowman, recently, and I kind of interrupted her while she was in the middle of her schoolwork, but she did have some interesting things to share. So you're a rising junior at Georgetown. Correct. And, and you are in the middle of exams and final projects. Technically, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and like idiot, I assigned you something at this time to do for us. Who is more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? Well, well there you go. So, <laughs> so this, um, uh, then the project work is, is kind of a long-term project. We're going to be looking at uh, satirical websites and, and, and discussing their, their merits and so on. Um, but I was also wondering that, you know, in your research that you've been piling together, whether you've, kind of, you've seen anything or learned anything. I have. So I've noticed a couple trends. And one of the stuck out to, I guess, me personally, was that multiple of these major publications were actually started by either current college students. So they were they founded it while they were in college or they had just graduated from college. Mm. Uh, so that's one group. Another group uh, that we'll probably get into another time is that a lot of them were started by journalists who, couldn't, who just couldn't take this garbage anymore. <laughs> it's like, I'm sick of real life. I'm sick of absolute objectivity without uh, a lean. I need to, to kind of mope about this stuff. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I also, I, I mean, I, I, you know, when I was at college, I, I went to Harvard and the Harvard Lampoon was there, which has uh, been going on, I think, since 1876. Uh, as a place where satire and, and, and college students got together and, and, and created this kind of nice little bundle of energy and to, to comment on the world as they see it. And it seems like that universities have, have been a great uh, launching pad for so many uh, great folks. I know, for example, Connor, uh, uh, Conan O'Brien uh, was at, at the Lampoon, as well as John Updike and, and other people like that, that... Um, I would like to imagine, because I think that you have started your own group, right, at, at Georgetown. Maybe 100 years from now, people would be talking about you. What do you think? Oh, we can only hope and pray. All right. <laughs> we'll see. If we can actually get our camera to turn on, then we'll see what happens, I guess. So, I mean, tell me a little bit of, of what it's like, the, con the kind of, uh, when you're talking about a satire group and starting something at a college, what, what is it you, you're doing and what are your kind of dreams? Well, I guess I, I've really looked up to Monty Python for a long time, obviously. I guess I guess everyone in the world kind of knows who they are and likes them. But uh, And also the Cambridge Footlights, which is the half-dramatic group, half-comedic like comedic launching pad for... Honestly, they're, they have a whole Wikipedia page for former members who've gone on to be stars in the industry. Um, but I guess I wanted to create a version of that for Georgetown that also blended a mini version of SNL and Last Week Tonight. So 
And I used to, I worked for the Georgetown newspaper for a year. And frankly, I got some insanely helpful journalistic experience. Um, but I really, real I realized that and I actually got to talk with Seth Myers about this when I went up to New York. And I said, what, what do you believe is the, the benefit of being a political comedian as opposed to a straight up journalist? And he said that you actually, obviously this is a slippery slope, but he said he believes that his venue where you get to bring in your opinion actually allows him to bring in more truth. Obviously that's scary if you give that power to someone who sucks, but <laughs> if you, and again, like I was talking to John Oliver about this, he said that if you believe that in your heart, that what you're doing is morally and objectively right. Uh, if you have the ability to put a lean or put some sort of, uh, this really is the truth. This is morally correct. You should do this. If you do that, you can actually get to people's hearts. Uh, Wolf Blitzer, Don Lemon does this and he shouldn't. Wolf Blitzer cannot say, oh my gosh, our president is a pathological liar. It's true, but he can't say it because that's not how it works on CNN. Uh, that's not how it should work. And he's I, <laughs> right. Uh, but um, well, I, well, this is, you know, uh, very informative in that partly that, um, you're beginning to understand and tackle the the important elements of satire and anybody who does this as a profession and all people who are now stumbling into satire on the web through memes and, and other ways are under, are beginning to understand the power that satire can have to to take truths that people um, often can't easily digest but when you surround them with humor suddenly they become more effective and and and, and more capable of, of being absorbed into the society as a whole so but you know th this sounds like really great stuff I look forward to hearing more when, when we when we discuss this in the future um, but you've got to get back to work and I'm really sorry I interrupted and, oh, it. and so <laughs> we'll look forward to talking to you uh, in the weeks ahead and um, take care we'll see you soon take care mm -hmm. All right, so that's it for this week's episode, except we have one more part, and that's, of course, a visit by our good friend, Mr. Bowser McSchnauzer. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Bowser. How are you? I'm doing really good. I like that episode. That guy, Terry, is really smart. Well, I appreciate that. We try to get good interviewers on here. We need to change the interviewer, though. Okay, that's enough. But well, why don't you get back to your, your job, which is to provide a joke? Do you have one for this week? Oh, yes. Well, go ahead. Tell the folks. How many journalists does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many journalists does it take to screw in a light bulb? I give up. How many? None, because journalists shine light on the world by themselves. Wow, that is pretty good, Grover. Not very the Grover, J Django. You're not very funny, but I saw that that was kind of like a public service announcement that kind of worked well with this week's episode of Freedom of the Press. That's right. So, um, well, Maybe you're improving. Maybe you could get better if only the interviewer improved. Well, okay, we'll get on to that as well. So we'll see you guys next week. I hope we've got some great interviews lined up in the weeks ahead. Come on back. Spread the word. Keep well. Keep sane. And uh, look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Bye.